Ladies and gentlemen, we are nearly done with this entire series. In fact, this will be the second last episode. We're going to look at one more algorithm next time, and then we're going to wrap it all up. And this is not because we've covered everything there is to cover, it's because we've covered everything I know, and it actually quite closely mirrors what I've learned at school. The truth is, there is a huge number of graph algorithms out there, and I don't profess to understand them all. In fact, I'm pretty sure I understand only a very small subset. So yeah, with that in mind, in fact today we're not even going to be looking at an actual graph algorithm, we're going to be talking a little bit about the computational thinking that has gone into the algorithm so far, as well as a slightly different way of thinking that we will apply for next week's episode. So hopefully today's episode will be quite light, quite interesting, and then next time we'll go down the deep end. You're watching another episode of Graph Theory. Hello and welcome back to Graph Theory. So we've taken a look at quite a few graph algorithms up to this point, and I'm not sure if you noticed, but one thing is very common among many of these solutions. That is, when you're actually solving a big problem, you're actually breaking it down into simpler sub-problems and solving those. We argue that the reason why this works is because we can actually find optimal solutions for each one of these sub-problems, and we can put them together to easily create an optimal solution for our big problem. This is a pattern we see a lot, and it has a name. In fact, it is called optimal substructure. Optimal substructure is sometimes accompanied by what is known as the greedy choice property. Problems that exhibit this property can be solved by simply making the best apparent choice at each iteration, and that guarantees that the result at the end of the day is also the best one. Now, this idea is pretty abstract, so let's look at it in an example, and it'll all become clear. Let's go with Prim's algorithm, something we've seen before. As a very quick summary of Prim's algorithm, you start off at any starting point, and basically you grow your minimum spanning tree by picking the shortest edge from you know the existing tree itself, and basically selecting vertices as you move along. So what is the big problem? We want to find a minimum spanning tree. What is the sub-problem? Well, we already have a little minimum spanning tree inside of our graph, and our sub-problem is to expand it by one node. Finally, this algorithm also follows the greedy choice property. We simply need to pick the minimum each time, and the results we get at the end of the day is also minimized. Notice in fact that Prim's algorithm can conclude quite quickly. In fact, every time it picks a vertex, every time it picks an edge, it just keeps moving forward. At no point of time does it need to actually go back, throw out something we've already picked, and pick something else in its place. This is why Prim's algorithm is known as a greedy algorithm, and all greedy algorithms basically exhibit the same behavior. Every time you've picked something, you never go back on it. You just keep moving on until you've picked everything you can. But sometimes being greedy is just not the right thing to do. If you remember in Dextra's algorithm, we had to actually impose a restriction, and that is in the fact that none of the edge weights can be negative. The reason for that is because Dextra's algorithm is a greedy algorithm. It just keeps going forward, it just keeps picking new vertices. But when there's a negative edge weight, what actually needs to happen is you have to actually go back and possibly cancel some of the work you've already done. Since Dextra's algorithm is a greedy algorithm, it doesn't do that. And as a result, it trips up on negative edge weights. Now, apart from optimal substructure, another thing that comes up a lot is what is known as overlapping sub-problems. What this means is once again we can take our huge problem, break it down into sub-problems, and when we actually look closely at these sub-problems, we realize that some of them are identical. What this means is if we were to actually go ahead and do every single sub-problem, we are actually doing some repeated redundant work. One classic simple example to demonstrate this is the Fibonacci function. You've seen this before when I talked about recursion sometime in the past, 
essentially fib n is actually fib n minus 1 plus fib n minus 2. So what happens when we call say fib 7? Well, we end up with a lot of recursion. And in fact, the recursion tree looks something like this. But notice what is going on here. We are actually recalculating a lot of things many times. And this isn't just one instance of redundant computation, you're actually creating an entire subtree of redundant computations. Thankfully, as it turns out, if a problem actually demonstrates both the properties we've seen today, that is optimal substructure, as well as overlapping subproblems, we can actually, you know, have a different approach to solving this problem and make it work better. This approach is known as dynamic programming, which in a nutshell means that we can see that a problem is actually a bunch of subproblems, and we can see that because certain subproblems are being computed multiple times, we just save ourselves the trouble by saving the results and basically reusing the results. To make this all clearer, let's take a look at our Fibonacci example again. Since we're doing so much recomputation, why don't we just create another array and basically save the results of certain computations. While we still have to do all the hard work at the beginning, we are keeping track of our results in the array, which can be reused later on. For example, right here, we need to compute fib3, but since we've already computed it, we can simply reuse the known value. The performance gains cascade as we go on. When we reuse the result of fib5, we have actually saved ourselves from doing 8 recursive calls. What happens at the end of the day is, thanks to the dynamic programming technique used, we have cut out on a large number of steps. The array we use to store our intermediate results is known as the MEMO table, and this technique is known as memoization. Now, what we've seen today is one of the simplest ways to do dynamic programming. In fact, some sources even consider memoization to not be part of dynamic programming at all, but merely a related concept. We won't go there, it's a little bit too complex in the context of this episode, but suffice to say the problem we're trying to solve at the end of the day is to simply look for and not do any redundant computation. In a problem that has both optimal substructure and overlapping subproblems. Also, you should probably know that memoization isn't the only way to tackle this problem. There are other methods that involve reformulating the entire problem and as such, not even needing an explicit memo table. Now would probably also be a good time to compare dynamic programming to greedy algorithms. In fact, just for fun, let's also compare this with actually doing the problem exhaustively. Doing the problem exhaustively takes the greatest amount of time, but is the most straightforward to implement. A greedy technique is very fast, but only does this because it assumes that it never needs to backtrack. If this fails, we actually have a better alternative to doing things exhaustively by actually keeping an eye out for certain patterns. If we can spot these patterns, we can make use of dynamic programming, which allows us to save on doing some redundant work. So in fact, that is dynamic programming in a nutshell. Bear this in mind for our episode next time, because, well, next time on the series, we're going to talk about the traveling salesman problem which is one of the classic hard problems in computer science. Well, this basically wraps it up for today's episode of Graph Theory. Thank you very much for watching and until next time, you're watching 0612TV. Thank you very much for watching. If you liked this video, consider checking out the rest of my work on my channel. Alternatively, you may want to check out a playlist of the other videos in this series. If you'd like to show me some monetary support, I am on Patreon. You can find a link to my campaign in the video description. Of course, you can simply like this video or leave a comment. I'll be sure to respond as soon as I can. To keep in touch with my future uploads, do subscribe to this channel. And for even more updates, check out the official Twitter account for this channel at 0612TV. Thank you for your support.